Thanks very much, Justin. Uh, let's just get that back on the track. There we go. Um, yes. Hi. Uh, I'm Phil. Thank you, Justin, for telling everybody that. And uh, I work at Mint Digital, um, which is, uh, yeah, the home of desk beers. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, uh, I'll tell you about myself. That's me on Twitter and GitHub and everywhere else that you have a username that doesn't take, it takes apps. I don't know. Um, and yes, I've been doing Ruby for six years, JavaScript for a bit more. Um, I don't know about, uh, you know, yes, it's the assembly of the web. You know, we can all discuss how lovely JavaScript is or not sometime later. Uh, and I want to talk about performance, um, but, you know, most particularly front end performance. Front end performance. Um, because, uh, you know, there's countless, uh, I think, talks and, and ways of. Um, uh, uh, sorry, front-end performance of, of Rails apps sort of particularly, um, because th th there's countless ways of optimizing our code on the servers, and, and we've probably seen many talks and, and things about that in the past. Uh, and I wanted to kind of just bring up a few things that um, the front-end community uh, has been uh, kind of talking about recently uh, and see how that applies to our Rails apps, um, whether we have to do anything at all about it, uh, what we should be doing, and kind of where that's going in the future. Um, my front end performance, yes. Um, so there are some problems with front end, of course. Uh, sites are getting bigger. Um, they're requesting more resources, and this really kind of has to stop. Uh, and this, uh, this is why. This is a comparison of the top 1,000 websites from Alexa uh, by the HTTP archive. Um, so three years ago, in uh, in June, the average page size was 690 kilobytes and made 85 requests. But now we are now more than double that on nearly 1,500 kilobytes of page and 108 requests. Um, so why am I talking about this? Um, it's mainly because, uh, as, as Justin was saying, we, we, we do do a lot of things at Mint. Um, desk beers is one of them. We deliver beer to people on a Friday afternoon at work, and they like it. Um, uh, Bumpf is another one uh, where we print Instagrams onto marshmallows. <laughs> Um, it's a real business. <laughs> Shut up. Um, but like, but we do we do plenty of these things, and we're always like I mean these are actually two of the more mature ones now. Um, yes, printing marshmallows onto Instagram, Instagrams onto marshmallows is mature. Um, these are the mature ones now. Uh, but we're always kind of throwing up um, one-page sites here uh, to test out our ideas for new things. We're going for you know the early implementations, MVPs, all that kind of thing through to through to proper products. Um, and actually, we we I think we have five ongoing real products and and three or four things like that are in test phases at the moment. Uh, and so um, making them making them work, making them work for our users uh, from day one is important to me. Uh, and and that involves both the back end being uh, tight and fast and the front end being fast. Um, but, you know, we also don't have that much time to think about that. So, you know, that laziness that, uh, uh, that was mentioned in, in our previous talk um, has led me to, to look into what are the things that, that we can make sure, I can make sure are on all of these sites from day one to make sure, um, uh, to make sure that they're going to be served quickly. Uh, one other thing, I suppose, like a lot of these things that we put up quickly, um, do go on to, to Heroku, so a couple of these things I might mention uh, can be a bit Heroku specific, but um, everything really has a has a good meaning. So, uh, firstly, uh, we've got some uh, tools for measuring front end performance. Uh, you might have seen these, you might not have done, but um, my favorite one at the moment is running things through web page test. I'll show you what the output of that looks like in just a minute. Uh, we also have Google Page Speed Insights, uh, which is very useful. Comes up in Webmaster Tools or and Analytics uh, these days if you have either of those. Uh, and Yslow, which is I still run Firefox, unlike everybody else is on Chrome. Uh, but having y, uh, Yslow, well, it's probably a, it's probably a Chrome extension for it as well, isn't there? Um, and finally, uh, real user monitoring. Um, uh, this is actually something that I know um, I'm not so good at, um, but. I know that uh, so real user monitoring is actually using um, browser uh, implemented uh, timing uh, uh, timing API um, to measure how long it takes to navigate between pages, how long it takes to load pages, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it is included in um, uh, Google Analytics now. Actually, if you have that, you can find it buried in an option down the left-hand side of Google Analytics. The uh, their real user monitoring. Uh, I think New Relic has that. If you have New Relic, so that, all, all that kind of thing. 
Uh, this is the output of web page test. This is what it looks like to download uh, to, to open deskbeers.com. Um, and this is a, a big waterfall of all the resources. Um, embarrassed to say that's 40 resources that this page pulls in. Um, that's quite a lot. It's not 85 from three years ago or 108 now, but yeah, it'd be less. Um, and what you can see is the things uh, as they um, as they download. And so the top page is the HT the top bit's the HTML. And once it's done with that, it gets the CSS, the JavaScript, some images, uh, some more images, um, jQuery. And, and then it goes down further to fonts um, and then social buttons, which is actually some of the pain down at the bottom, really. Um, and, and you see this kind of waterfall and this staggered effect uh, due to how a browser gets a web page. And um, a browser can have up to six connections to your server. Uh, we can fake this by giving it different domain names, but currently DeskBiz only has its one. So we see kind of those uh, early pink uh, there it is. These kind of early pink things are actually uh, SSL negotiation uh, as it starts up a thread to the server. But then as it uses, reuses those threads later, we just get the green download of the things. A um, couple of other things on here. Uh, the, the green line here is actually the first um, render of the page, where the user first sees something. And then the blue line there is page complete. Uh, and then as you can see, obviously, some more uh, deferred things down the right-hand side. Um, so our problems uh, in terms of delivering uh, websites uh, these days, uh, bandwidth and latency. Um, obviously, bandwidth is actually impre improving uh, day on day. I think the um, average global uh, bandwidth is 3.8 meg down, which is pretty good. Um, so actually, bandwidth is, is becoming less and less of a problem, and the really proper issue is latency, and that is kind of shown in all of these things that take time to come down. We can't make them come any quicker because it's limited by factors of how quickly it can get across the wire and you know how many negotiations you have to do with, uh, with SSL and th things like that. Uh, but finally, our real problem is, is user attention. Um, I don't know if you've seen this uh, um, table before, but it, it's kind of a, you know, when is somebody going to get bored waiting for your site to load? And sadly, it's, you know, it, um, it's, uh, so yeah, like if you're anywhere before a second, you're probably okay. But as it goes over a second, the user starts to think of something else. Over ten seconds, you're there, not coming back. Um, and uh, so our target really is to load our page into the browser and get the user seeing something happening in under a second, under a thousand milliseconds. Um, so fast front ends. Um, warning: some of this might not apply. Your mileage may vary. All of that kind of thing, uh, and what um, and why I put the tools up front is because uh, testing these things is the absolutely most important part of this. Um, some of the things do really apply across the board, uh, but most of them you want to just check and see: like, is this improving things? Is this making things quicker? Um, so keep running web page tests, keep running uh, things like that um, to to make sure. And the real user monitoring is the most important because if it makes it work in the uh, l uh, the lab environment that a web page test is giving you, it still might not work for your real users. So to start, concatenate and minify all of our assets. Um, but you know, thanks Asset Pipeline, we're actually fine. Uh, we're already doing that. Um, but what you can do, of course, is choose what you concatenate. Um, if you're if you're getting um, uh, CSS and JavaScript cached on the uh, on the browser. Then, uh, but you know, it's it's the entire lot of your JavaScript for the entire program, um, and you change a thing, it's going to invalidate that cache and bring an entire new thing down. So slower. So things like you know libraries, jQuery, don't necessarily uh, concatenate that into your entire thing. Um, other things that are not going to change quickly, um, change often. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, don't necessarily concatenate them. But as I say, this is the sort of thing you need to test. Um, so, you know, making up different manifests so that we can have uh, the ideal amount of stuff concatenated together with the ideal lower amount of uh, calls off to new resources. Gzip. Um, thanks, Asset Pipeline. It gzips things for us. I love the Asset Pipeline. I know it gets some slack at times. Um, gets some flack at times. It's slack. I don't know what I'm talking about. Some people don't like the, uh, the Asset Pipeline, but I think because of all the things it does give to us, um, 
And as I said, I kind of uh, hang around in the, the in front end communities as well, where over the last year or so, they've gone absolutely nuts for Grunt and then Gulp and then Broccoli and then back to Make. And I don't know what they're doing, but it's basically because they've never seen these things happen automatically for them before. They just thought they were loading JavaScript into a page and it was working. Um, so the asset pipeline just doesn't even let make us think about that kind of stuff. So I think it is great. Yes, sometimes it kills a deploy when, or your site because it deployed it, but your SaaS wasn't right or something. I don't know. So I like the asset pipeline. And it gzips uh, our content for us, uh, all our text content. Um, and it actually does it at the uh, kind of maximum uh, compression ratio, which is uh, you know, a fairly hard thing to do if you have Nginx uh, serving up gzip content and doing it itself, it won't put as much effort in, so it doesn't take as long to do. Um, but because we only gzip once, um, we have the smallest possible file. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and so what you actually kind of need to do is make sure that Nginx is serving uh, that static gzip file uh, 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 other, uh, uh, over the top of um, making it up itself or anything like that. Um, like I said, there's some Heroku things. Heroku makes you serve your assets yourself, of course. Um, and if you are serving them, uh, you need to point. It, it will not serve those gzipped assets. So uh, I cut, there's a couple of gems there which will actually uh, sit in and become middleware and get in the way and serve those lovely, lovely tiny gzip files. Um, so look those up if you're on, on Heroku for this kind of thing. Cache headers. Um, another thing that uh, you know gets done in in our um, uh, in our web servers normally, uh, but I thought I'd bring it up because that's the nice, easy way of Nginx doing it. And we can cache things forever because of the asset pipeline. Thank you, giving us all those MD5 um, URLs. Um, if you're on Heroku, don't forget to add in uh, a static cache control uh, header because again, it's not doing it for you. This is not the sort of thing that Rails would normally do. Uh, but if you're making the most of whatever you're, you're dealing with, um, static cache control, big age on the uh, on the assets. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how a web page is actually put together, uh, because that impacts uh, another bit uh, that I want to talk about here. Uh, and so we have the document object model, uh, which we probably all heard about, and then there's the CSS object model. Uh, which is probably less uh, well known, uh, but just as important to uh, creating a web page. So when your browser uh, requests the, the HTML, um, it then sends off requests, obviously, for the CSS and for our JavaScript. Uh, and it puts together the, the HTML DOM. It also puts together the, the CSS object model, which is about all, uh, it's, it's a similar kind of shadowy DOM uh, that, that looks onto the uh, real DOM. Um, and, and has all the uh, kind of assets and attributes about what those things are going to look like. And uh, then there's JavaScript. Of course, JavaScript uh, can change uh, the DOM uh, uh, on a whim, and, uh, and it can also query things in the DOM for, uh, uh, for their attributes uh, from the CSS. So um, the CSS kind of relies on the JavaScript, not changing the DOM. The HTML relies, no, the HTML is going anyway. Uh, the JavaScript relies on the CSS being done, so basically they block each other out until they're both downloaded if you're doing it at the same time. Um, and so once you've got all that in place, then you get a render tree layout and, and paint. Um, so the, the suggestion always in, um, in, in front-end performance is the CSS goes in the top and the JavaScript goes at the bottom. Uh, I actually opened a pull request to Rails on this uh, just the other day uh, to change the default um, application layout to do this, and I got shouted down, um, rightfully so, because TurboLinks is a uh, is a default thing in in uh, in Rails. Does anybody use TurboLinks? Like, okay, not as many people that use um, threads. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use Turbo Links. I didn't think about it when I opened this pull request. I got a bit confused, but so you know, the prevailing thing in Rails right now is still that Turbo Links is the normal, uh, and so the JavaScript goes on the top as well, so that it doesn't get replaced when it replaces the whole page, and that's fine. Except you know, your all those pages running Turbo Links, I suppose, will be fairly swift after that first page load. But your first page load is going to be a big white page until you have all the CSS and all the JavaScript. Um, to take it one step further, um, there's this notion of the critical path. Uh, and sorry, that 
that little diagram kind of is the critical path, and you need the HTML and the CSS and render and tree. Uh, and if you can wait for the JavaScript and make it come later, then do. Um, but the idea uh, ideas um, recently include uh, actually kind of taking that CSS that um, taking the CSS that is important for everything that's above the fold, the things that your users are going to see um, before anything else, and inline that into the head, um, which means you don't have to make any requests. You are getting the CSS and HTML in one re sorry in one request the HTML and your user will start to see stuff as it happens on the page. And then the rest of the CSS uh, can be loaded uh, at the bottom, fill in the rest of the page, and, uh, and everything looks really snappy. Uh, again, uh, so uh, there's a great talk. Um, I will put these slides online later. And these are all the red underlined things are links. Uh, and there's a great talk by Patrick Hammond of The Guardian, who um, uh, talks very much more in depth about this and how they deal with that at The Guardian. Uh, and it's incredible, and they they are for a you know massive um, organization aiming for that um, load before a second, and and achieving it with things with tricks like this. Um, so I, I encourage you to go and watch that. Um, and then uh, the Guardian team actually um, do their entire front end uh, development in public on GitHub. So you can actually, I mean, that's a link um, where they actually take that idea of inlining the CSS at the top, and they move on one more in which uh, they then cache that remaining CSS in local storage in the browser. Um, and if it's cached, uh, instead of making the request, they just bring it out of local storage and stick it into a style, uh, a style tag. And, um, uh, and there is no kind of jolt as the remaining CSS hits the page. It just happens in the head. Uh, and that's a, that, that's a link to their uh, GitHub uh, repo and the conversation they had about this idea, and they came up with it and tested it, and it seemed to work for them. So uh, all that kind of thing is, is, is very interesting, I think. Uh, the Garden are doing an incredible job of this kind of stuff. Um, and finally, uh, uh, just online a couple of weeks ago appeared a critical path CSS generator um, in which you input a URL and your CSS, and it will tell you what that critical CSS is. Uh, I don't know how good it is necessarily, but this is a step towards automating it, which uh, which would be fantastic if you could just have that as uh, something uh, that you can just add into the asset pipeline or something. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, so that's all kind of the text-based stuff that we can uh, we can make quick and fast and appear and, and make the page load to the users at the right time. Um, images are another beast uh, because a lot of that. Um, you know, that 1,492 kilobytes of the average top 1,000 web page these days is mostly images. Um, uh, and so these kind of things need to be as, as optimal as they can as well, of course. Um, so lossless compression, uh, we can apply lossless compression. Well, I mean, before you, if, if, you're, uh, if you're adding assets, images as assets to your application, then you should, of course, be working towards the best kind of lossy uh, compression uh, you can add to that image as a PNG or a, or a JPEG um, because that has to be done by eye. You can't really make that an automated thing, otherwise you'll end up with artifacts everywhere. Um, but the lossless compression is something we can certainly uh, automate away, uh, and um, there are uh, we can make the asset pipeline do it. Of course, there's a Sprockets image compressor uh, gem um, which simply does just sits in the in the asset pipeline, and as your images come through, just strip away all the headers, all the rubbish you don't need in which to display, display an image. Uh, I think this one actually works on Heroku as well, because it um, includes uh, a compiled um, image magic kind of, oh, not image magic, sorry, like JPEG Tran and OptiPing and things like that. Uh, the, just the underlying things that uh, do this work for us. Um, uploads. So. Like we've obviously looked after our own compression, we've compressed our own assets, but when you've got uploads coming into the uh, um, into play as well, other people are sending you their bloated, overly used um, uh, JPEGs. So um, we can uh, like Paperclip, Carowave, both have optimizers that do the same thing as well, uh, and that just sit in the uh, uh, um, in the middle of your op uh, upload and optimize away before you even have to think about it. So get those involved as well. Progressive JPEGs, uh, something I only really have uh, looked at recently. Um, and a progressive JPEG uh, is uh, a way of uh, a format of JPEG in which um, 
First, you download a, uh, a less um, less tight kind of version of that. I've got a picture. Um, <laughs> rather than the uh, rather than the thing kind of dropping down from the top, you get a blurry version and then a less blurry version and then the version that you the, you were expecting. And um, and oddly enough, uh, actually doing this can uh, result result in smaller file sizes for your JPEGs as well. Um, I, it can result in larger. It's not a big difference. But what it does do is give that perception of speed that that image is all the way there, and then it kind of comes alive to you. Um, so again, we can make the asset pipeline do that for us. There's, uh, there's the image optim uh, gem, which you just include in an application, and uh, and you don't have to think about it anymore. It, it rail ties its uh, um, asset pipeline thing in. Uh, and that's uh, and that's that. And you can actually, I think, um, we got this. Yeah, for for something like Paperclip, actually, you can make uh, Image Magic do this uh, simply by adding a convert option, interlace plane. I think interlace line works as well. They're both options to give it to get uh, a, uh, a progressive JPEG. Um, and yeah, that just is going to give the impression that your 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 image is loading faster. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, inlining things. Um, this is uh, this is uh, particularly useful if you've got small images or SVG images uh, that you're using maybe as, as logos or icons. Um, and instead of including a bunch of other resources, you can just inline uh, that resource straight into the CSS as a as a base64 encoded uh, bit of data. Uh, base64 does make it about a third bigger, but then we're g-zipping that all away again at the end. So it's a, it's a very nice way of, do, of of including this without having to go and look up images all over the place um, and load them into your page. Uh, there is a gem rail sass images, which allows you to just simply call inline and an image path. And uh, when that is um, that is put together, uh, sass will go get the SVG. Put it into base 64 and you're done. Uh, this is certainly another one of those ones that you absolutely have to test. Uh, now, in Bump, uh, we have uh, the developer on that has actually inlined the home page image into the, um, the home page kind of massive image into the CSS. Um, his uh, opinion on that, and I'm trying to get him to test this, his opinion on that is that even though the CSS takes a bit longer to load and you're a bit white screen for a while, you then you, the whole page just appears and it's done, um, and it doesn't kind of give you the page and then the image later, uh, which he seems to prefer. But I, I you know, I want to see tests for that. I want to see A/B testing to see if that which one's faster, which one's better. Um, so I, I recommend inlining small things, uh, small icons, especially if they're SVGs, because that's already text and it's going to be fine. Um, good. So that's all the things we do. Uh, at the moment, oh, sorry, uh, there is CDNing as well, but uh, I, I'm not going into that at the moment simply because uh, I don't have sites big enough that I'm dealing with a CDN. I know Rails has very easy ways of giving uh, asset hosts, and you've probably used that before. Um, but what I want to talk about uh, finally is the future, and that's um, coming in the ongoing work and the spec of HTTP2, uh, except the future is kind of here today in the work in Speedy. And, and, and reading about HTTP2, um, Speedy is really, uh, the, the, it is HTTP2 in practice. It's testing all the things out that they're trying to put into the spec. And uh, most of it is kind of agreed on, and there is just kind of niggles around the edges and the implementation details. Um, so to, to get the, the benefits of, of, our, um, uh, of HTTP2, we can do today. And um, so the features of this uh, are that um, we just use a single connection to the to the web host, uh, and uh, and and you can multiplex uh, all the downloads uh, over that single connection. Um, supposedly, this is actually what TCP is much better at uh, than uh, this kind of short bursty ways that we use it in in HTTP at one point one at the moment. Um, there's also request prioritization, so that the browser can say, I, I would like this more, or the server can say, this one's more important, all that kind of thing. And they're, they're, each the browser and the server are willing, uh, are happy to kind of let each other do with those priorities what they want to. Uh, and finally, there's actually server push. So instead of the browser having to uh, read through your HTML document to find out where all your images, your CSS and your JavaScript are, you can actually tell it. Don't worry about looking through that. These are the things we're going to want. Start downloading them now. Um, so those are the features. Um, what's exciting is uh, it's actually really well supported. Um, 
this is uh, this is canoused.com uh, with Speedy. Um, just recently with the WWDC um, keynote, uh, Safari 8 was being uh, touted as having Speedy. We have it in Opera, Safari, uh, near Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and I uh, that that partial um, support there uh, just counts for the fact that it won't do it in in, uh, in Windows 7, but IE 11 in Windows 8 will do Speedy. So we can use it, uh, and there is um there are uh, there are modules for both Apache and Nginx uh, that do the work as well. The only thing about this, of course, is now we have the single stream. Um, we need to adjust a couple of the things that we've been doing to uh, optimize um, the front ends uh, that I've just spoken about. Um, so we need to stop concatenating files. Um, screw you, asset pipeline. Get out of the way. We just want everything to come separately because the browser is actually able over the um, over over speedy to to turn things down if it's already got it. So you don't have to worry about downloading it. It it can ask for the things that it does need and get them at higher priority. Um, so uh, concatenating it all up is uh, is just a waste of of a single kind of. It can then end up blocking those streams a bit. If it takes a long while. We can actually stop inlining as well because you're not getting any of the benefits of browser caching if the if your icons or whatever are inlined. Um, and finally, and I actually don't know how to do this yet, but we we should learn how to start using server push. Um, that's what I'll be looking into next. Um, so I kind of want to uh, you know make an argument that we need to to get Rails ready for for Speedy. Um, ready for it? Let's get it done. Um, let's. We need to be able to negotiate whether we're on an HTTP 1.1 or, or a speedy connection and, and decide whether um, we give uh, our big bundled load of assets or all the little ones individually uh, and let the browser decide what it wants to do with them. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's mainly what I want to say. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. If you